Good evening. I'm Dr. Ronald Weber, Director of the Humanities Program at the University of Texas at El Paso. Welcome to an evening with Ron Stallworth. Before we go on, I want to thank the UTEP College of Liberal Arts and Dean Dennis O'Hearn and the African American Studies Program and its director, Dr. Michael Williams, for their support in this presentation. My personal thanks go to Mr. John DeFrank, Administrative Assistant in the Humanities Program, and to Alan Hodson and Jonathan Childress of Proper Print Shop for their work and technical help in organizing and presenting our program. In the Humanities Program, we brand our courses and our mission as the study of human expression, structuring our courses to serve students to realize the meaning and thereby the connections among the diverse subjects and activities that make up their college experience. Humanity students question the state of the world through shared inquiry of expressions in the many forms of art, literature, and music, examined in their context as connected articulations, students evaluate the cultural and intellectual heritage of humanity with the goal of understanding themselves and our times. We have been led here today by a noteworthy piece of literature, literary and cinematic expression, which we hope stimulates all of us to explore such basic human questions as the rights and responsibilities of individuals in the community, concepts of human nature, and the human species as victim and antagonist. We hope that in some way we can stimulate you tonight to explore with us and to realize the connections between what we realize here and the courses, actions, experiences, and discoveries of the rest of our lives. This conversation tonight is in large part the inspiration of Ms. Ruby Montana. She will serve as our moderator and host. She currently works as a lecturer in the humanities program here at UTEP and an instructor at El Paso Community College. Born and raised in El Paso, Ms. Montana is a graduate of UTEP where she also received her MA in philosophy. She has a deep interest in modern culture and thought and issues of othering and oppression. However, what I most admire in her is that she is one of those individuals who is deeply committed to the ideas and ideals of her discipline. She lives what she professes. This has been, this has brought her here tonight. It has inspired her work with the Osher Lifelong Learning Institute, where she awes an adoring audience with her discussion of subjects such as critical thinking, classical literature, logic, and more. Moreover, it is her public commitment that motivates her efforts for animal rights and animal rescue, as well as for politics and social justice. Our guest of honor, Mr. Ron Stallworth, heads his resume with the title, The Real Black Klansman. We are proud to have him as a fellow El Pasoan. We've all been entertained and informed by Spike Lee's movie rendition of his experiences infiltrating the KKK in Colorado Springs. If you have not seen the movie, I urge you to take time to do so. As a historian, I would love to explore the place of this piece of cinematic expression in the history of black cinema. It carries an eye-opening message and it is a wonderful piece for a humanities class. But we are actually here to do a deeper dive into the greater depths of Mr. Stallworth's broader experiences. Our focus will be more on the best-selling book, Black Klansman, a memoir, which inspired the Academy Award-winning movie. Our focus will be on the more detailed account of Ron's experiences as a police officer depicted within the book. And while Ron's experiences in Colorado Springs eminently qualifies him 
to address the issues of police brutality and institutional racism in our police departments, I want to point out how much broader his experience is. He describes his work as community policing, in the streets and in the suites, working with an array of local stakeholders, gathering intel on developing community issues and problems. In the course of his career, in addition to Colorado Springs, Ron has also worked in the Wyoming Division of Criminal Intelligence, the Arizona Department of Public Safety, and the Salt Lake City Department of Public Safety, where he created the city's first gang task force, a division that continues to operate. In all of these instances, Ron has, lay, has had to deal with the racist attitudes and policies that permeate police culture. And we look forward to his insights on how police culture contributes to the problems we are seeing in the news more and more each day, and to what we all need to do to reform such practices. Throughout this program, there'll be opportunities to purchase autographed copies of Black Klansmen, and you'll be pleased to know that Ron is working on a book on hip hop rap and its social influ influences. It is due out later this year. Work is also going forward on another book of his experiences tentatively titled Black Klansman 2. So to get to our program, let me present Ms. Ruby Montana and Mr. Ron Stallworth. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to tonight's event. My name is Ruby Montana, and I'll be your host. I'm a lecturer at the University of Texas at El Paso in the Humanities Program and an instructor of philosophy at El Paso Community College. Um, I'd like to start by first uh, thanking Dr. Weber for his kind words, and I'd also like to thank my colleague, John DeFrank of the UTEP Humanities Program, as well as the team at Factory Frontera for all of their diligent efforts in making this uh, event tonight a possibility. Uh, as Dr. Weber mentioned, one of the main focuses in all of the courses that I teach have to do with issues of othering and oppression. The great words of Martin Luther King Jr. have long inspired me, where he says that an injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. Now, for these reasons, I am extremely excited to have our guest uh, with us tonight, Mr. Ron Stallworth. Ron Stallworth, I feel, is the embodiment of what it means to repudiate hatred and division and racism and take a stand against such evil notions. Now, before I turn it over uh, to Mr. Uh, Stallworth, I'd like to uh, uh, point out a few things. First of all, please forgive us for any technical difficulties that may occur. Um, obviously, this is live and this is on light. So in advance, I am very sorry if anything unexpected does, uh, does arise, but we are, we are doing our best, okay? um, I guarantee that. Uh, additionally, I'd also like to let you know that uh, you have two options for purchasing Ron Stallworth's book, and I'll let him describe the second one. Uh, this is the standard book, uh, Black Klansman, uh, but there is also a second option, which Mr. Stallworth will talk about, that is um, this beautiful looking uh, edition here, so I will ask him about that in just a moment. Now, as far as the way the evening will proceed, um, I'll begin our discussion by highlighting certain portions from the book itself. I'd like to ask Mr. Stallworth to expand as the, uh, upon some of the passages that I've chosen to highlight. Uh, additionally, I will then turn to some questions that we received in advance prior to today's event. And then lastly, I will open it up uh, to you all who are watching. If you have a question that you would love to ask the real Black Klansman, Ron Stallworth himself, then you will absolutely have that opportunity. And you can actually type in your question at any point that you don't have to wait until the end. So please feel free to look at the right side of your screen and type in your question there. So now with that, I'd like to go ahead and welcome Mr. Ron Stallworth. Uh, Mr. Stallworth, thank you again so much for joining us uh, tonight. We were absolutely honored to have you here. Thank you very much. Uh, point of correction, please. I worked for the Wyoming Division of Criminal Investigation, not Intelligence. And I was never uh, employed by the Arizona Department of Public Safety. I worked for the Arizona Drug Control District, later known as the Arizona Criminal Intelligence Agency. 
All right, thank you for those clarifications. We certainly appreciate that. So I'd like to start uh, off by first highlighting a portion of the book where you are being interviewed for the position of police officer. And in this particular scene, a Mr. James Woods, a black man and civil employee, is asking questions that essentially outline the unique challenges that you are certain to, to face in the, in the near future at this point in the book. So I'd like to read the passage of the book um, and you all can follow along, please. You recognize that there are no blacks in this department. This is Lily White. You're going to be up against a lot to make yourself a success. These people don't deal with blacks unless they are arresting them. Would you have any problems interacting in an all white environment? So Mr. Stallworth, can you tell us about some of those other questions that you were being asked at that time? And also, can you relate what was quite clearly being uh, implied by such questions? Well, what was clearly being implied was the fact that uh, the Colorado Springs Police Department in uh, November of 1972, when I interviewed as a position with the, uh, for police cadet, not police officer, but police cadet, um, it was a civilian support job within the department. Uh, during that time period, we went to the police academy. We uh, functioned as civilians in, in a uniform capacity, but civilians nonetheless. Uh, we were basically training to be cops. And when I joined that department in November of 1972, it was a department of 250. And of those 250, everyone but uh, two officers were white. The two officers uh, that weren't were uh, Latino. There were no blacks. So I was walking into uh, basically an all white department and uh, breaking new ground. Among the questions that was uh, asked of me, the most pro provocative question was, how will you respond if someone calls you a nigger? And at the age of 19, I had to uh, respond to that question. I can only imagine what that must have, have felt like. I'm sure it was extremely um, powerful. Now, um, there's a, a scene also in that same chapter where a lieutenant was tasked with uh, giving you your police uniform, and he actually commits a, a microaggression, a racist microaggression against you by not uh, issuing you a hat that properly fit over your uh, hairstyle, which was uh, an Afro hairstyle that you were wearing back then. Now, Mr. Stallworth, can you please um, explain to us what is a, a microaggression and how did you respond to that particular one that was committed against you? I wouldn't call it a microaggression. I'd simply say he was an asshole. <laughs> he, uh, he uh, and excuse my directness, but I don't mince words uh, as anyone who knows me is well aware. He simply uh, could not accept the fact that I, a young black man was about to uh, enter the ranks of his lily white department. And uh, he held the power. He was in charge of, uh, of uh, equipment acquisition and distribution. And uh, he held the power at that particular uh, moment. And I had a very, uh, very nice, uh, well coiffed afro at that time. Uh, and they did not know how to deal with the fact that uh, I had a different hairstyle than uh, what normally accompanies a white head. So um, he gave me a hat that was approximately a size and a half, maybe two sizes too small. And when I put it on my head, I look like a circus clown. Uh, in the book, I describe it as one of the organ grinder monkeys you see in a cartoon where they have a hat that's too big for their head. And uh, uh, that's how I looked. And I recognized the fact that I looked kind of ridiculous. Uh, and I told him about uh, the discrepancy in size. He laughed it off and uh, basically told me to deal with it. So I didn't say anything. I simply accepted uh, what the, the hand that was dealt to me. I walked out of his office and uh, for the next uh, few days, I walked around town. Uh, during the lunch hour, and uh, I put the hat on my head because we had to wear a hat when we walked out of the department. 
I put the hat on my head and walked down the streets of Colorado Springs, quite frankly, looking ridiculous. Uh, and I knew the uh, sights that people were uh, observing, the finger pointing I was getting from citizens. I knew what they were pointing at. I knew what I looked like. But I was going to play his game and I was going to come out on top. And that occurred one day when I came back from one of these outings and a, the chief of police pulled up in his car and saw me and asked me, why are you wearing your hat that way? And I told him why. He told me to go directly to that lieutenant and tell him to give me a hat that fit my head and my hairdo. And I smiled and walked upstairs to that office and told him what the chief said. And he very angrily gave me a hat that fit. <laughs> So in the end, I won. He got beat. I have to admit that at that scene in the book, um, I had to put the book down and, and just applaud. So <laughs> I, I really, um, I love that response on your part. Now, I'd like to turn to um, the day that you were sworn in, and I'm going to read another passage uh, from your book. In your words, you describe, on June 18th, 1974, my 21st birthday, I was sworn in as a police officer for the city of Colorado Springs the first black to graduate from the ranks of the police cadet program. To say this felt good was an understatement. I had made history in Colorado Springs and I knew whatever lay ahead was going to be both fulfilling and exciting. So my question to Mr. Stallworth is, can you expand on how you felt on that day? And additionally, how do you feel now when you re reflect upon the fact that you were the first black police officer in all of Colorado Springs Police Department? Well, Point of correction there, I was not the first uh, black police officer. I was the first black cadet. I was the okay. first black to graduate from the cadet program. By the time I graduated, the department had hired, uh, I believe, four other black officers. Uh, this happened about four months, five months before I had turned 21. So at that point in time, when they hired the other four, there were then at that time five of us who were black in the entire department. But I was the first uh, cadet to graduate uh, from the ranks who was black. Uh, how did I feel? Uh, a sense of exhilaration. Because when you are, when you first get hired on, you're on a one year probation. In that first year, uh, during that probationary period, you could be fired at any time by the chief of police. I had survived that first year. And I knew at that point that I was going to make it to the end. Uh, and graduate into the ranks of a police officer. But I still had to mind my P's and Q's and I still had a microphone, I'm sorry, a microscope on me in terms of my behavior. Um, when I got, when I interviewed with uh, James Woods, the city personnel manager, he made it very clear that uh, they wanted me to become the Jackie Robinson of the Colorado Springs Police Department. Those were his words. And he asked me if I knew about Jackie and his ordeal. I said, yes, I did. And he said, can you go in that department, possibly being called digger and a few other choice words, can you function without responding in an angry, physical manner? I grew up in El Paso. I had been called that word many a time when I was growing up here in El Paso. And I learned how to deal with uh, being called that word. I told him I could. So the fact that I graduated as a cadet, moved up into the ranks of a police officer status, that was a very exhilarating moment for me. But I knew the challenges were still ahead because I wanted to be a detective. Uh, more specifically, I wanted to do undercover work and uh, that was in the future. And I appreciate that portion of your, your book where you describe um, just how committed you were to becoming a detective uh, to the point that other officers felt you were you were pestering them, but um, again, you, it proved to be successful. So that's a really exciting part uh, to see. Now, um, one of my favorite scenes in the Spike Lee adaptation of your book uh, is when you first make contact with the KKK. Um, it's humorous. It's uh, it's ex exciting to say the least. And I'm wondering if you can describe that initial contact with Ken O'Dell of the Ku Klux Klan. Can you tell us about that first conversation? Yes, a lot of people think that I had a master plan when I started that investigation. For the record, I did not. The whole investigation happened purely by accident. Uh, I saw, as the movie depicts, I saw an ad in the classified section of a local newspaper. 
the ad said Ku Klux Klan for information, and then there was a P.O. box. So what I did was I sat down and wrote a letter addressed to the P.O. box, and basically I was pretending to be a fellow white and a, a, a racist and a supremacist, white supremacist in my, uh, in my ideology. And I wrote this all down in the letter, told the uh, unknown party I was sending it to that I hated, uh, and I quote, niggers, spicks, chinks, Jews, Japs, and anybody else that isn't pure Aryan white like I am. And that I wanted to make a difference in the world uh, for white people. And that's why I wanted to join the Klan. I then made what could have been a serious mistake. I signed my real name, Ron Stallworth, instead of my undercover name. I had two of them. And I didn't uh, do that. People ask me, why didn't you? All I can tell them is that I had a brain cramp that day. So I signed Ron Stallworth. I sealed the letter up, mailed it off, forgot about it. And about a week or so later, I get a phone call in my office on the undercover phone line, which back in 1978, when this investigation took place, the undercover phone line was untraceable. I get this phone call, I answer it, and the voice on the other end said, may I speak to Ron Stallworth? Now, for context, no one called that number unless it was in an undercover capacity. It was an investigation. I had not given that number out to anyone, so it took me aback uh, for a few seconds. I replied that uh, you're speaking to Ron Starworth. He identified himself as Ken O'Dell, the new chapter president of the Colorado Springs KKK. And he said he got the letter, wanted to know why I wanted to join. So I repeated what to him on the phone what I wrote down in the letter. His response to me was kind of chilling in retrospect. He said, you're just the kind of guy we're looking for. When can we meet? And that, ladies and gentlemen, officially launched my <laughs> investigation. And the rest is history, so to speak. <laughs> now, yes. um, another, another very powerful scene in the, in the book is where you are assigned to attend a Stokely Carmichael, also known as Kwame Ture, uh, speech. And they asked you specifically as a black man to go in order to gauge the audience reaction and report on any potential trouble such as, and I use that, you know, any trouble such as, uh, you know, black revolutionary uprisings, um, things of that nature. Now I'd like to read a portion um, uh, from that particular scene where you are there at the Kwame Ture uh, Stokely Carmichael uh, speech, and you said, now I was proud of being black and being a cop. I was proud of my blackness without being angry. I was in awe of Stokely because he was a figure of the civil rights movement. People like him, Martin Luther King Jr., Malcolm X, Rosa Parks, Tracy Taylor, John Lewis, and so forth, made life better for people like me. But now here I was being thrust into this unique situation. And I had no qualms because I could differentiate being a cop who is black and being a black man in white America. So, Mr. Stallworth, can you tell us more about your emotions being there at the speech as a black man on duty, as a police officer? Can you expand upon, upon that for us? Well, the Stokely uh, encounter occurred about three years before the KKK investigation started. The Stokely encounter was in 1975. I had been on the department uh, not quite a year. Um, it occurred in April of 75. So when I got the call, they knew that I wanted to work undercover. We had no black undercover cops uh, whatsoever, and uh, they knew that I wanted to do that type of work. So when the uh, situation came up with Stokely, they automatically came to me. And uh, it was a challenge to say the least. They wanted me to go up against one of the leading figures of the civil rights movement, uh, the man who coined the phrase black power. They wanted me to uh, deal directly uh, with him. And uh, I was thrilled by the opportunity, not to mention the fact that he's a slice of black in American history. And I was going to have the uh, close up encounter, if you will, with him. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, when I went to that meeting, I found myself in a strange position. Again, I was a black man in white America, but I was also a black cop. And we black officers all across this country, we live in a uh, 
a dual world. On the one hand, we are too black for the white citizens that we serve. But on the other hand, we are too blue, as in our uniform, for the black uh, community of which we are a part. So we have to learn to navigate the, the streams of uh, these, two, uh, these two roles. How do you be a proud, defiant, challenging black man and yet stay within the confines of the law and be the black cop that you automatically are? And we automatically have to learn how to navigate those waters and how to come out on top and not lose our identity as black men while maintaining our professional identity as police officers. And uh, that is a challenge in and of itself. Uh, a lot of blacks don't wanna join the police department because of that. I had no problems with it. I still have no problems with it. Um, I enjoyed the fact that I had that encounter with Stokely. I enjoyed the fact that uh, I was able to ask him that night. Uh, he gave a very fiery uh, 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 speech on uh, race relations in America. Uh, one of the things he said was that uh, uh, we would have to one day take up arms to kill, and I quote, Whitey. And when he said that, a lot of people in the audience, if, if not the entire group, started yelling out, uh, right on, brother, black power, and they'd raise the, the power fist. Now, I was working undercover. I am a proud black man. Some of the things Stokely said that night made perfectly good sense to me as a black man. And I raised my fist, too, the first uh, time or two that he said that, and then it dawned on me. You can't be doing this. You are in an adversarial world with this man, and you are a cop first in this uh, uh, situation. So after uh, I raised the fist uh, probably the second time, I quickly brought it down and I stopped yelling right on or black power and just simply listened. And that, again, goes to the duality that I talk about. So we sometimes tend to forget, while being on the job as black officers, we tend to forget that we are, in fact, black. Uh, or I should say that we are in fact cops and we revert to our blackness first. And that's what happened to me in that situation. I was responding as a black man and not functioning as a black cop. So we got out of that situation that night, and went back to the office. I wrote a report uh, after being debriefed by my superiors. I wrote a report of what Stokely said on what I uh, gauged the audience reaction to be and uh, any threat level that might occur, which I didn't feel there was one, uh, I wrote that in my report. And the very next day I was back in uniform uh, patrolling my uh, district. Now in this section that you just uh, elaborated upon, uh, you briefly mentioned uh, John Lewis. And I understand um, that you uh, had an opportunity to meet the legendary John Lewis who just passed away uh, last week. Can you tell us, Mr. Stallworth, about that encounter meeting John Lewis and what that, uh, how that affected you? Yes, it was backstage uh, in 2019 at the Academy Awards. Uh, Black Klansman had just won the award for the Oscar for Best Adapted Screenplay. Uh, if anyone in the audience saw uh, the Oscars that night, they saw me go on stage. And uh, I stood uh, next to Spike Lee and the other three uh, winners of the award. Um, it was a very thrilling moment uh, to be at the awards and look out at the audience and see all these people. Uh, it was a position that I had seen on many an occasion on TV. And for Patsy, my wife and I to be there was a once in a lifetime experience. But minutes after the award, we walked backstage where all the winners were interviewed by the press. And Mr. Uh, Lewis, John Lewis, was walking back there. And uh, he approached me. And I held out my hand, introduced myself to him. He said he knew who I was. He had read the book. And he told me it was a very important book. These are his words. This was a very important book. He thanked me for writing the story. He said my story needed to be told. Uh, 
thanked me again, congratulated me on the fact that my story had basically just won an Oscar. And uh, I asked him if I could have a picture with him. He said yes. And uh, there's a photo uh, on Google where uh, he snapped that photo, actually, uh, him and me in the camera. And uh, I will treasure that for the rest of my life because he was a great man. And he was, uh, uh, at that point, he was the third member of the civil rights uh, leadership that I had actually encountered uh, face to face. The first being uh, Dr. Ralph David Abernathy, Martin Luther King's second in command, the second being Stokely Carmichael, and now Mr. Lewis. Mm. That's phenomenal. That really truly is uh, remarkable. Uh, and, and speaking of photos, uh, in the book, there's another uh, scene that's extremely powerful and, and, and humorous at the same time. It's a scene when uh, KKK Grand Wizard himself, David Duke, uh, comes to Colorado Springs, and of all people, you are assigned to uh, to protect him. Now, can you tell us about that experience being assigned to protect David Duke? Um, and also, can you please relay about that um, that photo that uh, is really quite hilarious and and just uh, awe inspiring, really? Well, first of all, for the audience, that scene actually took place in real life. Um, I don't have the photo. I've lost the photo over the years, but I can assure you there are people all over Colorado Springs uh, who saw that photo uh, and in Denver as well. Um, on the morning of David Duke's visit to Colorado Springs, which was January 10th, 1979, my chief of police came to me and told me that uh, he, had been, he had been getting death threats against uh, the life of David Duke. David was in town for about six hours or so on a publicity blitz, and uh, people were calling in, threatening to kill him. My chief came to me and said, we're getting these death threats. He said, I don't want anything to happen to this man while he's in my city. We have no other personnel available. I'm assigning you to be his uh, bodyguard. I protested as vigorously as I could, told him I'm talking to this man on, a, on the phone on a fairly regular basis. and if you assign me to him, we're going to be in close proximity. He may recognize my voice, and I don't want to uh, take the chance of that happening. The chief said he understood. He said, but I have nobody else. You're it. And at that point in time, I became David Duke's bodyguard, unwittingly and uh, really not wanting the assignment. So I went to uh, the hotel where David was at, and I walked up to him in plain clothes. Keep in mind, I was still undercover. I introduced myself to him and uh, I didn't tell him my name. I simply said, I am a detective with the Colorado Springs Police Department. I don't agree with your philosophy or political ideology, but I am a professional and I will do anything and everything within my power to see that you get out of my city alive. He thanked me. He was very polite, very courteous. That was David's way. And then he shook my hand. He gave me the Ku Klux Klan handshake which he didn't know that I knew. And uh, I started my uh, stint, if you will, as his bodyguard. We go to a location where he was going to give a speech to his followers. And uh, I had brought a Polaroid Instamatic camera with me. And uh, I bought it because I figured no one would ever know, uh, believe me if I told him I was his bodyguard. So I walked up to him and I, basically said, Mr. Duke, would you mind taking a picture with me? No one will ever believe that I, a black man, am, is your bodyguard today. He said, oh, no, not at all. So I gave the camera to Chuck, the white officer posing as me. And I walked uh, back to David Duke. I stood between him on my right and the Grand Dragon for the state of Colorado on my left. And I put my arm in their shoulders. The Grand Dragon thought it was hilarious. David Duke pushed my arm away and very sternly said, I can't be seen in a photo with you like that. I said, I understand, excuse me. And then I walked over to Chuck and whispered to him on the count of three, snap the photo. And then I went back, stood between David Duke and the Grand Dragon of Colorado. And on the count of three, I said one, two, and on three, I raised my arm, put it back on their shoulders, 
and Chuck snapped the photo and the perfect image came out and uh, Spike depicted it almost identical in the movie. David Duke, I might add, rushed away from me as soon as the picture was taken. He rushed from me to the camera, tried to snatch the camera out of Chuck's hand, and I beat him to it. I grabbed the camera, he tried to snatch it out of my hand, and I told him as sternly as I could, if you touch me, I will arrest you for assault on a police officer. That's worth about five years in prison. Don't do it. And he just glared at me with the most hateful look you can imagine. And I stared back with a sly, sneaky smile on my face because I knew I had bested him. And he then went over to his followers and gave a speech on white supremacy. And I stood off on the side and kind of chuckled to myself. <laughs> and that is the stuff that movies are made of, <laughs> literally. <laughs> Um, now, uh, Ron, I'd like to um, ask you, um, and, and I'd like to uh, turn to one of the darker scenes, and uh, actually I think, it, in my opinion, one of the most devastating scenes in the entire film, uh, Black Klansman. It's the scene where Harry Belafonte plays a witness to the horrific and gruesome uh, 1916 lynching of the young Jesse Washington, who was only 17 years old when he was lynched by a mob in Waco, Texas. And this lynching consisted of him being beaten and then castrated and then burned to death over a span of two hours. Now, I'd like to point out um, to the audience that according to the Tuskegee Institute, between the years of 1882 and 1968, approximately 3,446 African-Americans were lynched in the United States. Now, according to mappingpoliceviolence.org, Black Americans in the United States were killed at three times the rate of white Americans by police officers. Now, what are your thoughts on police brutality being compared as a form of legal lynching, considering how many of them essentially get off without paying any type of, of consequences? Well, first of all, they get off because we live in a racist society. America, in many respects, should not be spelled uh, with a C. It should be spelled with three Ks because that is the history of this country. It has long been the history of this country, dating back to before we even became a country. Uh, we all witnessed a, a lynching on TV. Where we saw the killing of George Floyd about a month and a half ago, or so ago. Uh, we saw a killing on TV when we witnessed that video of Ahmed Arbery down in uh, Georgia uh, when he was uh, uh, attacked unexpectedly and shot while jogging. Uh, these are lynchings. You don't have to be hung from a tree to be lynched. And these were lynchings that were done by law enforcement or people connected to law enforcement. I love my profession. I'm a diehard supporter of my profession, but when cops break their constitutional oath and violate the law, then I am totally against them, and I'm against the agencies that support them and the institutions that back them up, the political institutions. We are living in a society right now where this is at the forefront of our uh, national discussion, and the person that should most be involved, namely one Donald Trump, is absent from that discussion. We have a white supremacist leader in the White House, and I use the term leader very loosely, but we have a white supremacist in the White House, and he has given credence to these type of uh, actions on the part of uh, fellow like-minded whites. That is why it is essential that in November, we band together and we get him out of office because he is corrupt, he is a, a dirty politician, and he is a national, uh, national white supremacist, and uh, we can't have that in that country. Things will not improve for me as a black man until he is gone, and if it's not gonna improve for me, it will not improve for anyone else in this society. Now, related to what you just described, um, there's a passage in the last chapter of your book where you state that many people people often ask you if there are any correlations between 
your investigation of the KKK and modern day times. I, I believe it goes without saying that uh, what we're seeing today, especially after the recent deaths of Ahmaud Arbery, Breonna Taylor, and George Floyd, uh, there are some very clear and stark correlations uh, to that. Now, do you feel that there is something that we, as, um, as uh, people who are watching at home, something that we can immediately do to help eradicate this, this gross pandemic that is racism in our country? besides the vote, um, which is extremely crucial, absolutely. Yes, there are things that can be done and we're seeing it in, uh, we're seeing it occur in real time. When you have people protesting throughout this country as they have been doing since the George Floyd lynching, when you have people of all races, all creeds, all colors, both genders, including transgender people, LGBTQ people, when you have this rainbow coalition, if you will, of people protesting uh, police violence, protesting for Black Lives Matter, that is a change in the uh, civil rights uh, of today, civil rights movement of today, versus what was going on during Martin Luther King's time when I was a child. Yes, there were white supporters of the civil rights movement. We were all aware of that. Some, many of them got uh, uh, brutally killed. But you didn't see the numbers of white people then like you're seeing now. You didn't see this co coalition uh, manifest itself like it has done in the past uh, two months or so. That is very encouraging because that tells me that America is finally waking up, or I should say gotten woke, as Spike Lee would say. They've gotten woke to the fact that this does not just affect black people, but it affects all of us. And if they can lynch me and get away with it, then doggone it, they can lynch the, the uh, average white person and get away with it. Black police officers who violate their constitutional authority should be held in check. And they should be held in check to the highest extent of the law possible. These are rogue cops. They're nothing more than criminals. They need to be uh, dealt with to the fullest extent of the law. Thank you, Mr. Stallworth. And um, I'd like to remind everyone uh, that if you would like to purchase the book, you are absolutely able to do so without leaving our event. If you look at the top right of your screen, uh, you'll see what looks like a, a shopping cart icon, and you'll be able to purchase the copy of Black Klansman, which um, I hope after our uh, portion tonight highlighting elements of the book. If you have not read it yet, then you should absolutely be intrigued to, to read it. It is a phenomenal, phenomenal book. Um, I, I really cannot speak highly enough about it. Additionally, there is uh, this beautiful limited edition uh, that is available for purchase as well. Mr. Stallworth, can you give us a little bit more detail about this, um, this beautiful edition of your book? Yes, uh, what you're showing the audience is uh... Uh, about a year ago, I was approached by Easton Press out of the uh, back from back east, and they wanted uh, permission to print a limited number of uh, signed, authenticated copies of Black Klansmen um, bound in leather and uh, printed uh, uh, with gold, uh, 22 karat gold, uh, gold leaf. And uh, what you're holding is uh, that book. Um, it is a commemorative edition. Uh, they only do that on certain uh, publications, and they told me they felt Black Klansman was one of the publications that was truly worthy of uh, uh, them giving this treatment to. So I'm very honored that that book is out. Uh, it is a very limited uh, edition, uh, copies that are available, and I would encourage everyone to buy it. Uh, it's not cheap, but again, it's uh, uh, leather, and it's 22 karat gold, gold leaf. It is absolutely exquisite. So again, if you'd like to purchase this beautiful version of it uh, or the, the regular version, uh, just click on the right top portion of your screen. The shopping cart icon will take you to that option to, to purchase them. So what I'd like to do now is turn our attention to some of the questions that you all, the audience, emailed to us prior to today's event. So, Mr. Stallworth, I'm going to read some questions that we received um, from, from people. So, I'll just start um, with that. So, 
So Mr. Stallworth, uh, someone would like to know, in what ways do you think changes in negative social societal attitudes and beliefs regarding black people are as important as any policy changes resulting from current demands for structural and legislative changes? Well, all change in the attitudes and beliefs towards uh, violence towards black people is very important, uh, excluding the politics that are involved. Uh, we cannot have a change in uh, systemic racism until people get a change within their own hearts about why they may be racist or why racism exists and how it is affecting people, traditionally uh, people of color. Uh, and to break it down even further, going back to 1619, to people that look like me. Uh, here on the border, we are dominated by Mexican culture. It is a uh, Mexican dominated society. My, my lovely wife is uh, Latina. And we're coming up on the one year anniversary of a very heinous act in our history with the uh, killing that took place August 3rd at Walmart. I believe it was 23 people that got killed and I forget the number of uh, people that were injured as a result of that shooting. That was a pure act of racism. That occurred in that young man's heart through some means. I don't know if he was raised that way or if it was from the influence of uh, hearing people like Donald Trump. But something drove him to come from Dallas, Texas, that area, to El Paso, Texas, and search out, hunt on a destroy mission to kill Mexican, uh, Mexican people. So until we can change that basic belief, that basic sense of uh, superiority that uh, I'm better than you because I'm white and you're black or you're uh, Mexican, until that changes, we are going to have uh, very little success politically because a lot of the politicians share those very same beliefs. They just have learned to control it and conceal it a lot better. But they're pulling the levers of power. That's why it's essential that everybody get out there and vote in November. Absolutely. I could not agree more. <laughs> now, um, we have a question from uh, Pablo Espinosa. And Pablo asks, Mr. Stallworth, why hasn't the Ku Klux Klan uh, not been grouped? Why, I'm sorry, why hasn't the Ku Klux Klan been grouped or categorized as a domestic terrorist group? Well, Congress back in the late 19th century, when they held hearings on Ku Klux Klan, defined them as uh, terrorists. Um, but they have not taken up that mantle in uh, modern times. Uh, everybody knows that they're terrorists. Uh, JFK and Lyndon Johnson waged a war with through the FBI against them down in Mississippi at the height of the Civil Rights Movement. If you have seen the movie Mississippi Burning, that depicts some of the actions they were taking uh, to uncover the killings of the three civil rights quarter, uh, Schwerner, Goodman, and uh, I can't think of the lady's name, uh, Cheney. Um, but uh, the Viola Liuzzo, I'm sorry. Uh, but nobody has ever done a concerted effort to uh, literally attack the Ku Klux Klan in the same manner that our military is attacking ISIS and uh, the Taliban. And uh, that's something that needs to be done. That's something that never will be done the way our current political climate is, but it needs to be done and dealt with uh, very uh, frigidly. I fully agree as well. Now, our next question that was sent to us, uh, Mr. Stallworth, considering your 30 plus years long career as a police officer, and in conjunction with what you have witnessed on a national level regarding police brutality against Black Americans, what does police reform look like to you? Well, the first thing I'll say is uh, people need to stop the nonsense about uh, eliminating the police, completely defunding them and putting them out of business, because that begs the question, what are you going to do when you need help? Who are you going to call as Ghostbusters? Uh, uh, would proper, properly uh, say. Uh, there's a need for policing in America. Should they be reformed to a certain extent? Most definitely. But to uh, defund them, 
and put them completely out of business as uh, people in Minneapolis are, are advocating? No, that's the wrong approach. Uh, one thing you need to do in order to uh, effectively reform police departments is you need to rein in the police unions. They have too much power, too much authority. And uh, when a police union can override a decision made by a chief of police because that officer has got uh, union protection, then uh, something is wrong with that equation, especially when that officer does something that everyone across the country can see is a violation of uh, his constitutional authority because it has been captured on film. Uh, something needs to be done. So I would say uh, police reform needs to start with uh, the unions, reining them in. Uh, one element of police reform that needs to be taken and has been done all, all across the country, but not very effectively, is the uh, police department should reflect the nature of the population that they serve. Um, I had some personal experience with this in Colorado Springs. I was uh, sent out on a recruitment mission to try to get more blacks to apply for the police department. And I never have forgotten this conversation I had with these two uh, black men who questioned me about why they should join the department. And I gave them the usual spiel about, you know, uh, you put in 20 years, you get a pension, you get all the benefits, uh, a chance to further your education, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, I said, you get a chance to make a difference in your community. And then they told me that they could never or would never consider becoming a cop, could never do it because A, they didn't like, and I quote, pigs referring to police officers, and B, they could never ever arrest a fellow a black person, a, a brother as they put it. And I said, what if that black person, that brother, has gone out and viciously raped and assaulted somebody in your family and killed a, a member of your family? Their response to me was, I couldn't do it. He's still a brother. That attitude is not only sick, demented, and wrong, but that's one reason why we have some of the problems that we have is we don't have more minorities, Blacks, Hispanics, you name it, in law enforcement to make a difference. Your police department should absolutely reflect the, the percentage of what the population breakdown is from an ethnic standpoint. And if it doesn't, there's a problem there that needs to be addressed. Secondly, we need to have more education required of cops. When I joined the police department, all I had to do was have a high school diploma, which I got by, from Austin pa High School, by the way, go Panthers, and uh, uh, you needed the high school diploma and nothing else. You had to pass uh, the routine battery of tests, uh, the interview. Uh, they didn't even do psychological exams back then. They do now, but they didn't then. I had to pass a polygraph, a lie detector. That's what 1972 uh, police work was, was all about, to get on the job. They have since tightened that up, but you have to have uh, more stringent uh, testing, in my opinion. To eliminate those uh, cops that come on and are immediately on a power trip. There's a lot of them that are like that. But having said all that, I would like to leave with, I hope, as a positive note. As bad as law enforcement seemed across this country, it is only about 1% that fall in that bad category that I've talked about. Your police departments are basically good. Those guys get into this work with a sense of dedication to make a difference in their community. Yes, they want the good pay that comes with it. Yes, they want to make a difference. Some of them like looking good in the uniform. I never liked wearing a uniform. Others do. But the bottom line is they are there for a purpose. And we need to recognize that fact and not paint the police department with a broad brush based on the actions of the few that you see on TV, such as what occurred in uh, the case of George Floyd. On a, in a similar uh, um, vein, I'll turn to a question that was emailed to us by uh, J.D. Espinosa. And J.D. asked, as an African-American police officer in the 70s, what were your goals and aspirations? 
From the time I got hired on the police department at the age of 19, all I wanted to do was be an undercover cop. Um, I liked wearing street clothes. I liked looking like a black militant with my big afro. I liked walking around in bell-bottom pants and leisure suits and uh, being able to uh, blend in with the, uh, the crowd, so to speak, and yet no one in that crowd knew who I was or what I represented. I liked the fact that I had a gun in my hip underneath uh, my leisure suit. Oh, God, I wish they'd bring leisure suits back. I liked them. <laughs> but I liked all that. And uh, I didn't want to be, I had no aspirations to rise up and rank. Uh, I just wanted to do undercover work. And the reason why I did uh, retire from the Colorado Springs Police Department is because people wanted me, people within the department wanted me to uh, try and rise up in the rank hierarchy uh, of rank. And uh, that went against my wishes and I wasn't going to give them control over my career. So ultimately I sought uh, satisfaction elsewhere and that's how I ultimately uh, eventually made my way back to El Paso. And we are certainly happy to have you. <laughs> Thank you. Now, turning the uh, conversation back to modern day issues of uh, police reform and the like, uh, we have another question that was submitted to us via email that asks, what are your thoughts on how officers de-escalate situations using moves such as the chokehold? Do you believe that such maneuvers as chokeholds should be banned within police departments? And what type of new training should officers receive in regards to de-escalation methods? Well, de-escalation should be first and foremost when you're in a uh, situation where it looks like uh, there may be some physical activity uh, occur. Uh, you should try to always de-escalate the situation. Um, as far as a chokehold is concerned, the only time somebody should be put at a chokehold is if you're in a life or death struggle and it's your life versus their life. And in a situation like that, I have no intentions of dying or I had no intentions of dying. So if I had to put someone in a chokehold, then I would have. But otherwise, there is no justification for using a chokehold. Um, it's dangerous, as we've seen. And uh, unless you're unless you're well trained and well versed in uh, those dynamics, you should never use that uh, that particular hold. So I'm against uh, the chokehold in general, unless it's used in a life or death situation, which is the same requirement for you uh, using your gun on somebody or stabbing someone if you have to resort to that. Uh, if it's your life or the life of an innocent third party, <coughs> you should never use something that could result in death. You should always try to de-escalate. And I think in a similar fashion, that takes me to another <coughs> question that was uh, emailed to us uh, regarding the recent Black Lives Matter protests and responses from the police. Uh, someone emailed and asked us, in regards to protest and crowd disbursement, should tactics like rubber bullets and tear <coughs> gas be used by police officers during protests? Only if the crowd has become, uh, gotten unruly to the point where they have become violent and that violent is, violence is directed at the uh, police officers on the scene. Um, we all saw the video a few weeks ago of uh, Donald Trump walking across to the church in which they used tear gas and uh, rubber bullets to disperse uh, peaceful protesters. I was watching it on TV. Those people were doing absolutely nothing except minding their own business, exercising their constitutional right, uh, First Amendment right of uh, free speech and freedom of assembly. And then the tear gas came and then the uh, rubber bullets were fired. Uh, it was, that was absolutely a violation of uh, the law, the constitution. And it was done on the command of uh, the gentleman in the White House and his uh, roguish attorney general. That should never have happened. 
and I view rubber bullets uh, the same way as I do uh, chokehold uh, and uh, real bullet. Until your life is put in uh, danger to the point where you have to take such uh, extreme action, it shouldn't be done. It shouldn't be done. It shouldn't have been done that day. Thank you, Mr. Stallworth. And I see that we did have a live question regarding uh, defunding the police. However, I, I believe you did address that, but I'd like to ask something uh, very similar that was emailed to us uh, again on the same topic. <coughs> uh, do you think that the idea of a police force and its many functions needs to be rethought regarding delegating specific issues to other specialists, for example, social workers or well-being officers who can conduct mental health checks or take suicide calls, et cetera? Okay, let's tackle that. You have a domestic violence situation um, where husband and wife were going at it with one another. By the way, that's one of the most dangerous uh, calls in police work because it's so unpredictable. But you have a domestic violence situation. Do you want a social worker, a marriage counselor to come out and counsel? Or do you want someone that can take action on the scene, uh, whatever that action should be, and uh, deal with it then? Would you feel safe if you are in a violent encounter having a social worker there to try to talk? Think about that. In situations where we have a, uh, uh, an obvious uh, mental health issue, uh, I have no problems with having someone trained in that coming out and being on the scene. But do you want to call? a professional uh, therapist, clinical person, whatever you want to call them, to deal with a mental health situation when that mental uh, person with uh, mental health problems is unpredictable, out of control, or has the potential to be uh, out of control, which they all do because they are unpredictable. There are some problems with that thinking, and that's just a couple of them. It's something that should be looked at, I agree, but I'm not ready to jump on the bandwagon and say we should turn those services over piecemeal or completely to uh, those other functionaries. Police are necessary. Anyone who says they are not, you're working from the wrong, uh, the wrong political agenda. All right. Thank you, Mr. Stallworth. And now I'm going to look at some of the live questions that are coming in through the chat. So again, if you have anything that has not been asked, anything pressing that you would like to ask Ron Stallworth, please don't hesitate and go ahead and ask through that chat. So I'm going to turn to this question here. It says, uh, Mr. Stallworth, after seeing the murder of George Floyd and the horrible response by some of the police forces around our country, I withdrew my application and I'm deeply questioning my future. What advice do you have? And I'm assuming uh, that was a police uh, application. Uh, shame on him for withdrawing his application. If you were troubled by what you saw in the George Floyd uh, video, if you were troubled by the actions of the police and you were considering being a police officer and you in fact had applied to be a police officer, how can you make a difference and attack a problem that disgusted you and you had serious problems with? How can you make a difference if you withdraw your application simply because you saw one man, namely Officer Chauvin, and uh, uh, followed up by the other three officers that accompanied him, uh, you saw them act uh, so egregiously. You have to get involved and apply yourself to make a difference. You may just be one person, but that one person could be for the benefit of all. So, Whoever that uh, individual was, be it male or female, I think you made a poor decision and you should rethink and uh, reapply. The police work is an honorable profession. It is not a perfect profession, no profession is, but it is an honorable one. When you get the right people in place, you can make a difference. I like to think that I am an example of that. And you can make an example of that, be an example of that as well, but you have to first get involved. 
You certainly are an example of that, Mr. Spellworth. And that is a spirit that I believe with every fiber of my being and something that I relate to my own students on a regular basis. The only way to change the world is to is to be that change. Um, and that's similar to something that Mahama Ga uh, Gandhi stated, uh, be the change you wish to see in the world. So I fully agree. Now I'd like to turn to a question from uh, Professor <coughs> Diana Martinez of uh, UTEP who asks uh, regarding uh, current situations that we're seeing unfold in cities such as Portland, for example, um, how do you feel about Chad Wolf sending in DHS agents to arrest people off of the street? Well, first of all, I wouldn't call them DHS agents. I call them modern day American Gestapo. Okay. Uh, what we're witnessing is exactly what we saw in uh, Hitler's time. You see it on video uh, newsreel. Um, we're seeing it occur right here, right now, and that order is coming out of the White House through the uh, DHS uh, Director of Homeland Security. Um, it's wrong. You don't employ federal agents to aggressively attack American citizens in a city simply because some of those citizens got out of control, stupidly, I might add, and started putting graffiti on the, the side of a federal uh, building. That does not warrant uh, the use of tear gas, rubber bullets. That does not warrant uh, taking a stick, a billy club, and hitting uh, people upside their head or on their side, breaking their arm, their hand, like we saw with the Navy veteran uh, in Portland. Uh, that does not uh, uh, involve gassing the mayor of the city who is peacefully standing there protesting with his citizens. That is lawlessness firsthand and it's coming out of the American government. It may have the title of the uh, Department of Homeland Security. I call them Gestapo. That is a, a powerful statement. I thank you for that response, Mr. Stallworth. Um, next question that I'd like to turn to from the live chat. Uh, Mr. Stallworth, from your remarkable seven-month infiltration of the KKK, is there a moment you would consider the most impressionable on you while reflect reflecting upon your time during the investigation? After the closure of the case, did David Duke become aware of his, as you state, friendship that he created with you? What uh, impressionable moment did I have? Uh, let me just put it this way. Part of the, uh, the belief of the Ku Klux Klan, any white supremacy group for that matter, part of their belief is that because they are white, they are superior to people of color, starting with blacks, uh, Jews, and depending on where you live in the country, in our case, uh, the Southwest region, Mexicans, uh, brown skinned people. Uh, if you're over in San Francisco or any place where there's a large Asian population, they'll throw Asians in. So they feel they're superior to all of these others simply because we don't have quote unquote white skin. Uh, they even go so far as to think that uh, they are superior because blacks are on the same mental scale as chimpanzees and apes. And that one of the reasons why we have such a close alignment in our history with the Jewish population is because Jews are closer to being white than we are and therefore we need the Jews to lead us by the hand and steer us around. This is their belief. I've heard David Duke say that. So the most impressionable thing that I got out of that investigation while it was happening was the fact that without their knowing it, this person, me, who they consider to be on the same mental scale as an ape and a chimpanzee, I was basically making a complete and utter fool out of, out of them, and they didn't realize it. David Duke didn't find out until 2006 that he had been made a fool out of by one of those apes. That's when the story broke nationally, and he found out uh, after it went viral about what had happened behind the scenes. I still get a thrill out of that thinking about it. Uh, it basically proved to me that the uh, Super, genetically superior master race is not as superior as they think. 
I have to admit, I get quite the thrill thinking about his reaction to learning of what you did as well. So thank you for that. Um, I'd like to turn out to a question from El Paso mayoral candidate, Veronica Carvajal, who asks, how do we transform, not just reform, the culture of overaggression, the us versus them mentality and militarization of, uh, at El Paso Police Department? Can we do it one officer at a time, given the power of the union and the chief of police, or do we need structural changes? Hi, Veronica, how are you? Um, I can't speak directly about the El Paso Police Department. I have had no uh, direct dealings with them. Uh, so to say that they're overly aggressive, uh, I'm not willing to make that leap yet. Uh, I, I've seen no signs of it uh, personally in the time that I've been back here and what I have witnessed when I have seen uh, uh, El Paso police officers doing their job. But to answer your question generally, uh, there should not be a, a, a aggressive uh, nature to policing unless and until you have to get aggressive. We should not approach our encounters with the citizens that we serve in whatever capacity you may serve. We should not approach our encounters with our citizens uh, from an aggressive manner unless and until we need to be aggressive with them. And when we do, we need to be as aggressive as uh, necessary in order to get the situation under control. And then the de-escalation process uh, immediately should kick in. Each situation is different. If a situation occurred with an El Paso officer, I would have to see exactly what that situation was and see what that El Paso officer did or how he did it before I would be willing to go and say El Paso police are too aggressive. So that's my answer. All right. Thank you, Mr. Stallworth. And I'll turn to uh, a question that is uh, somewhat similar. Um, the user says, uh, El Paso has a CIT team, police officers working alongside social workers to handle situations where mental illness is involved. I have witnessed this professionally and per personally. Do you have any thoughts on the CIT? If, um, if El Paso has interest, instituted a program such as that, I applaud them for it. Um, obviously, there must have been a need for that professional um, social worker person to ride with the police officer and work with him or her in conjunction with their regular duties. And I think if it's, a, if it's an experimental uh, phase, I think it's an experiment worth pursuing. Um, that goes back to what we uh, talked about earlier about uh, de-escalation and, and uh, def uh, defunding the police and completely eliminating their role. Uh, it's, it's a situation worth uh, uh, looking into, uh, whether it's gonna be or is successful or not, I couldn't say, I, I wasn't aware of that. But I, I do applaud the department for uh, being that pro progressive and willing to uh, look into a program like that. All right. Thank you. And our next question comes from Marcela Aguayo, who would like to know, did the KKK ever retaliate against you because of your investigation? And with the book and movie now being released, how has your life changed? And what advice do you have for young people today? And she also thanks you for sharing your experiences with us. Thank you very much, ma'am. Um, the direct answer is no, they did not uh, retaliate against me directly. However, after the story broke nationally in 2006 and David Duke became aware of this investigation, uh, my picture, a big uh, color photo of me, appeared on the Stormfront, which is a far right extremist group of white supremacists. Uh, and in fact, it was a, a group started by Don Black. Don Black was David Duke's uh, Alabama Grand Dragon when I was dealing with David. Uh, Don, Black, Don Black Stormfront Group put a full color photo of me on their uh, website. And basically the caption read uh, something to the effect of, this is the uh, nigger that made a fool out of David Duke. And 
I read about eight pages of uh, conversational thread on that site, and I chuckled throughout uh, most of it because basically they were calling me uh, nigger, and they were calling, uh, talking about uh, somebody should do something about me and put me in my place. Um, and it alert, it, I was alerted to this by the local FBI office in Salt Lake City who contacted me and told me that they had been contacted by one of their offices in Maryland, uh, a gentleman who worked that uh, field and was monitoring it, came across it, saw my name, and it word got back to me. So they subtly went that route, but nothing ever occurred from that. I've never worried about them coming after me for the simple reason that as an undercover cop, that's a normal uh, issue that you have to deal with and you take it as it comes. I've only said, and I will say now, I'm fair game. It's my story. I lived it. And as an undercover cop, I was willing to deal with uh, any repercussions that might occur. But you damn well better leave my wife alone. That's all I'll say on that subject. As for how has my life changed uh, since all this happened, the movie, the book? Patsy and I were talking the other day, and uh, I mentioned to her, and she mentioned to me, it's still hard to imagine that two years ago we were sitting in, uh, actually a year ago, we were sitting at the Academy Awards uh, awaiting an announcement as to whether this story was going to win uh, an Oscar. Uh, I'm just a kid from Yandel Street who went to Alta Vista, went to Bassett, and then graduated from Austin High School. Patsy went to St. Joseph's. She went to Austin. We graduated in the same year, 1971. And no, we were not high school sweethearts, but we did know each other. But it's still hard to imagine after this uh, time gap that we were sitting there and we were part of the crowd. I still have a hard time uh, with the fact that my book became a number one New York Times bestseller. Never in my wildest dreams did I imagine that happening. One of the things that has occurred as a result of this type of celebrity is I have people that I know who, it's kind of funny in a way, they're very sheepish about approaching me in some cases um, and think that I sit on a different plateau than they do. And I don't. As I said, I'm just a kid from El Paso. My wife is just a kid from El Paso. Nothing has changed in our life. If anything, it's the people around us that have changed. I have found that uh, celebrity, uh, there are certain challenges that come with it. By the way, I will write about that in uh, one of the books I'm writing. One of the challenges that comes with celebrity is uh, people look at you different. They want to treat you uh, different. Uh, and people think, you're wealthy. I'm not wealthy, ladies and gentlemen. I live on my pension from the Utah Department of Public Safety and Social Security. Okay. But I have people that think that I'm wealthy and they want to get money from me or they want to hit me up for money and whatnot. Uh, it's not going to happen. So celebrity changes those around you. And one of the things Patsy and I promised each other is that it was not going to change us. We were going to remain these two kids from El Paso. We're going to try to honor the city as best we could with the celebrity that we have. And uh, at every opportunity, we both uh, do our best to, do, to apply that, uh, that creed, if you would. Thank you, Mr. Saworth. And I certainly admire your uh, humility and um, because you certainly are a, a rock star to many people, including myself. So thank you for that. Now I'll go ahead and turn to a next uh, question. Uh, Mr. Stallworth, what racial hate group do you feel is the most dangerous today? Oh, that's difficult to say because you'd have to uh, categorize them, quantify uh, the, the degree of their uh, involvement and everything. And I have to acknowledge the fact that I've been out of the game uh, since I retired, and I don't uh, stay up on it as much as as, uh, as I should. 
Having said that, any white supremacy group should be a matter of concern wherever they may exist in whatever part of the country they may exist. Um, the very fact that we have a white supremacist in the White House, the very fact that he has given uh, he has given voice to their aspirations, and I might add, what Donald Trump uh, says. They know, they fully understand the meaning behind his word. And what Donald Trump says, and he's been saying it since he started his campaign around 2015, some of the things coming out of his mouth, I heard out of David Duke's mouth way back in 1978 in my phone calls with David Duke. So what I hear coming out of Donald Trump's mouth is not new. It's old regurgitated history. The only difference is now it's coming out of the mouth of somebody who has the reins of power at his disposal. And we're seeing the effects of that literally on a daily basis. So we should all be concerned about any white supremacist group that may exist in our, in our midst. But don't uh, get hung up on, on whiteness. There are, there are uh, radical extremist uh, blacks out there. There are radical extremist Mexicans out there. You pick the group, you pick the ethnicity, you pick the color. They're out there, and we should all be concerned about that because it all goes against constitutional principles, and we all should want to live by those constitutional uh, decrees. Certainly, I absolutely <clears throat> agree with that. Now, Paula is asking, Mr. Stallworth, how do you believe TV police procedurals, for example, the Law and Order franchise, have normalized or even glorified aggressive behaviors by police towards suspects? Well, one problem with that statement is she's assuming that we cops sit around TV watching these uh, uh, depictions and then we get hyped up and go out in the street and want to put them into a physical manifestation. Uh, if anything, it's the other way around. A lot of these shows are depicting things that they have heard about, read about, and have a uh, technical advisor who used to be in the, uh, the, the profession who is advising them. So her statement is kind of twisted. Um, having said that, those shows, the biggest difference between those shows and real police work is they solve crimes in a half hour, and they always solve them nice and neat. And by the end of the program, the person is either in handcuffs or on their way to, to prison for, for life. Doesn't work that way in real life. Doesn't work that way in real life. Law enforcement is a time-consuming process. And uh, you start with an unknown and you try to piece together the known until you come up with a clear picture of who did the crime, uh, why they did it, their motivation, and uh, then how to go about capturing them and bringing them to justice. And that takes time. And part of that process includes uh, the community cooperating with the police as they go about solving the crime. A few years ago, and it may still exist, I don't know, but a few years ago, there was a, a no snitch movement going around the country especially within the black community and among young people. Uh, they took the belief that they were not going to be traitors to their race, to their community, and uh, snitch on their fellow citizens when they witnessed a crime. A lot of them flat out said, you're the cop, you figure it out, even though they were the eyewitnesses to the crime. A lot of crimes got unsolved or Cops had to jump through extra layers in order to eventually get to the truth. There was no honor whatsoever in the no snitch movement. And anyone who took a part in it should be disgusted with themselves for being a part of it. You as a citizen have a right to have a duty, or you should feel that you have a right and a duty, to cooperate with law enforcement when they call for your help in solving a crime. Think about it if it was your mother, your father, your child who had been violently attacked kill or rape. And an eyewitness saw it and said, I don't want to get involved. I'm not going to tell you. 
you figure it out. That is what we were experiencing a few years ago. And anyone who took that attitude or takes it should feel nothing but shame for themselves. It is imperative that you get involved with law enforcement when they're trying to uh, do their job and keep your community uh, safe. Everybody has a role to play, and that is your role as a citizen. Speaking uh, of police, um, we have a question asking if you'd like to share your thoughts on El Paso Police Chief Greg Allen commenting that the Black Lives Matter movement is a hate group. Let me just say this. I have nothing but respect for the chief. Uh, I honor his service, but I don't agree with that statement. And uh, that's all I'll say. All right, thank you for that. Um, I have quite a few questions asking about your role models as well as uh, what it was like growing up in, in El Paso, Texas. Would you like to share your thoughts on that? My role models? I had, I didn't consider him a role model at the time, but he, uh, in retrospect, he probably became one. An officer, he's deceased now. He lived right across the street from me on Yandel. His name was Bruce Mathis. He was one of the first black, if not the first black detective in the, in the uh, El Paso Police Department. I went to school with uh, Officer Mathis's daughter. We went to Alta Vista together. And uh, I can remember being over the house and seeing Officer Mathis when he would come home wearing his blue uniform. Uh, he was a big man, very tall. And keep in mind, I was about six or seven years old, so he was even taller in my eyes. But I remember him in his blue uniform and how uh, impressive he looked. The gun on his right hip, all the accoutrements on his belt and that blue uniform and cap and that shiny shield on his heart, over his heart. And I stood in awe of Officer Mathis. That flash forward from uh, that time period, the early 60s, flash forward to uh, 1974, the day that I officially became a police officer and put my uniform on, my blue uniform, for the first time. I put it on. I put my gun belt on, strapped it in place, put my hat on, and I stood in front of a full-length mirror, and I looked at myself. What crossed my mind? Officer Mathis from about almost 20 years earlier. So he became a role model, and he was my first contact with a police officer, knowing him as a neighbor. He was a good man. He was a good man. He raised a family here in El Paso. And uh, I had the honor of uh, getting reacquainted with Officer Mathis uh, in the mid, uh, uh, early, mid 90s, late 90s, early 2000s. I came back on a lecture and uh, I had lunch with him over at Famous Days on Mesa. And uh, it's one of the uh, more memorable moments uh, that I've had in my return to El Paso. But I still honor the memory of uh, Officer Bruce Mathis. So he was, he was a role model uh, un unknowingly to a young kid at the age of six or seven. Um, and I think every officer, who, when they encounter someone, when they encounter a citizen, especially a young citizen, should look upon that as, a, as an important contact in that person's life. You have a chance to make an impression, to, to do something positive with uh, the person you are, the uh, job that you hold, and the position that you're engaged in at that point in time. That kid, like I did, may grow up with that one single impression of you and of the, of the police force. You should take advantage and give off the most positive impression that you can. And maybe we can change some attitudes in the community towards uh, uh, towards police officers. 
The only other role model I would say that I had at that time was uh, my late uncle. He was a uh, career soldier stationed at Fort Bliss at the time. And uh, he raised seven kids. He and his wife, my mother's sister, older sister, they raised seven kids. Uh, they traveled all over the world, but ultimately they always came back to El Paso. And uh, one of the reasons why my mother moved to El Paso was she wanted to be near her, her older sister. Uh, and his name was uh, Roscoe, we called him Rusty. Uncle Rusty was, uh, was a very uh, honorable man. And I still honor his memory. Uh, he died in 1985, uh, and I still honor his memory to this to this day. And the final uh, role model, I would say, was my late brother Ken Ken Stallworth. He was a 1966 graduate of Austin. He married. Uh, he too married a Latina, who was a 65 graduate of Austin, and uh, he was a nurse. Got his training at the, the former Hotel Du, and he worked here for a number of years in hospitals, became an anesthesiologist. He joined the Army and the Navy in order to further his uh, education for, towards his career, and he ultimately uh, got out of the profession and became a uh, pharmaceutical salesman, and uh, he passed away in uh, 2009, and uh, one of the regrets that I have is that my brother is uh, not around to witness uh, all the success that's happened to me and to beat my uh, my lovely wife. Uh, he would have uh, got a kick out of all this. My final role model and the most important one of all is my late mother, Betty Lorraine Stallworth Madison. She passed away in uh, 2009 as well. And uh, my mother was uh, a, week, uh, a week shy of her 82nd birthday. And uh, she was aware that I had written a book. She was aware of my story. She understood it. She loved it. She liked to uh, brag to people that her son was a writer and uh, he had this phenomenal story, etc. cetera. Uh, she would get a kick out of the fact that uh, the story became as successful as it did. And I regret that she isn't around to, uh, to witness that. And uh, she, would have, she would have loved it. Well, I'm sure I'm speaking on behalf of everyone watching when we say that we're sorry for, for your losses, but that you certainly are correct in that they would be immensely proud of all that you've, you've accomplished. So uh, with that, Mr. Starworth, we just have two last questions. One is extremely lighthearted and then we'll have one final one so um alan would like to know where did you get that awesome t-shirt that you're wearing <laughs> i don't know there's a there's a quaint little store on montana called proper print <laughs> and proper print uh made this shirt uh they made a, a ball cap that i wear black there's black clansman on it and uh, they do phenomenal work. And anybody out there that uh, wants to have uh, monogrammed uh, things such as this, I would strongly recommend that they go to proper print. I believe it's owned by a guy named Alan. <laughs> what a weird coincidence. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh Proper Print Shop has made these items available, which you can purchase by clicking on the shopping cart icon on the right-hand side of your screen. Now, Mr. Stallworth, the final question, um, and I believe this is a, a really great way to end our discussion with you tonight. Um, where do you think this country will go from here, and how can we as individuals continue to effectively resist racism, police brutality, racialized violence, and inequality in America? and hold this nation accountable for its abhorrent treatment of black people and other people of color. Where is this country going? Let's uh, put it this way. We're going straight to hell as a society if we re-elect Donald Trump as president. I'll say no more on that. Um, we are going to hit the depths of our existence as a democracy, if we maintain a democracy, um, 
if people fail to get involved and affect change that's necessary. We all have rights that we are living with today as a result of the sacrifice that John Lewis made when he got uh, hit upside the head at uh, on Bloody Sunday at uh, Selma, uh, coming across the Edmund Pettus Bridge. Uh, we are the beneficiaries of what that man suffered, what Martin Luther King ultimately suffered, of what all the civil rights uh, grandmothers and grandfathers went through to make life better for, for us. It wasn't just me as a black person that benefited, it's the entire American society that benefited. So we all should uh, be thankful for their, their lives. But the only reason we have these benefits is because they were willing to stand up, stand out, and to speak out. We should be willing to do the same. Just on my level, I have lost friends in the law enforcement profession. I probably lost some supporters as a result of things that I've said today, simply because I have condemned the actions of uh, police officers who I feel are out of line. I have uh, come from behind the blue wall of silence that police tend to erect when they see one of us being quote unquote attacked by somebody, by an outsider. I am willing to stand up and condemn my profession when they're wrong, but I'm also equally steadfast in my defense of my profession when I see them as being in the right and that the public is in the wrong. But you have to be willing to take a stand on controversial issues. So I would advise and suggest that everyone get more actively involved Protest. Protest your disagreement with what's happening in, in government, in society. Protest peacefully. But when you get out of line, don't go complaining that the police are wrong for trying to keep you in check. Because the minute you get violent, and if that violent is the direct cause of your actions, the police have every right to come in and cool you off. That'll be my party board on that. All right, thank you so much, Mr. Stallworth, for joining us this evening. Your input, your insight is incredibly invaluable, and I'm sure I'm speaking for everyone who is watching when I say that we are immensely grateful to have you here in our city of in El Paso and to have you here with us this evening for this particular event. And I'd also just like to close by to get by again thanking uh, my department chair, Dr. Ronald Weber, for giving me the uh, thumbs up to uh, put on this event and also for the support from my colleague, especially, uh, I'm sorry, my colleague, uh, John DeFrank, who's also a dear friend of mine. Thank you for everything that you have done, John. And again, I'd also like to thank Factory Frontera for their efforts in, um, in doing the production side to this. And also a special thank you to Patsy Stallworth for her help in organizing. And one last final uh, thank you, Mr. Ron Stallworth. Uh, again, from the bottom of my heart, we, we sincerely appreciate your invaluable insight and input. And so one last reminder, um, if you haven't yet read uh, the New York Times best-selling book that was turned into an Academy Award winning, winning film, Black Klansman, what are you waiting for? Definitely get this book and purchase it. It is a, uh, a brilliant, brilliant read. And don't forget about the uh, exquisite limited edition version of it as well. So thank you all for joining. My name is Ruby Montana. I'm a lecturer at the University of uh, Texas at El Paso, as well as an instructor of philosophy at El Paso Community College. And I thank you all for joining us this evening. Thank you, Mr. Stallworth. And good evening to you all. Stay safe and healthy. Bye-bye. Thank you.